way that you know it was just so teased for yeah. five minutes you know and yeah finally comes in doesn't yeah. even say the name exactly you, Jedi, i am yep yeah when when the x-wing came in it's like it will it be luke and then you saw the black yeah. glove and the, the, the normal hand and this is luke yeah. right and they don't yeah. give you an answer for so long <laughs> they're really messing yeah. with you <laughs> yeah it's so good so good yeah really awesome uh, yeah it's good it's gonna be a yeah, long way till season three <laughs> yeah i it's weird i need to you know basically ask permission now to talk about anything that i'm working on presently mm -hmm. but i free to talk about all the stuff that uh, you know, I did with LucasArts, certainly, or Sony. Um, yeah. And I actually just just wrapped as the dialogue. Um, uh, I did it. I was an ADR director and did some voiceover for the new Medal of Honor for Oculus. Oh, nice. Uh, nice. So, yeah, still involved in games. I love I love games, though. I still don't have a PS5. OK. Um, so I haven't played in Cyberpunk or, you know, um, Miles Morales or any of the new titles. I have two young kids now, so playing, you know, I'm still behind. I still have The Last of Us 2 and Ghost of Tsushima waiting, and my all my friends worked on it. I'm embarrassed. Um, <laughs> I'm actually neighbors with an old colleague of mine from Naughty Dog, and and um, we ran into each other, you know, uh, walking uh, our kids and dogs, and everyone was wearing masks, and we got to catch up, you know. Um, and I, I didn't have the heart to tell them at the time that I was just like, you know, between... Um, all the work I'm doing with Skywalker and having two kids, I haven't had time to really dig in and play mature content, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I understand. <laughs> but, uh, but man, I, I, yeah, I love video games. Love yeah. Video games. Well, then we're at the, the correct spot because we're going to talk about video games. Great. Um, yeah, what did you want to cover today? I made a list with some questions. Uh, do you want to know the okay. questions first or will I, do we just start a conversation or how do you want to do oh, it? Yeah, just yeah, yeah, just start a conversation. Fire away. Um, so for those who don't know, who is David W. Collins and what is his first Star Wars memory? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Um, so, yeah, I am a um, uh, I'm a, a uh, sound designer, sound editor, recording mixer uh, at Skywalker Sound presently. I'm also a voice actor. Um, I've been hosting, you know, at Star Wars Celebration, but all of that is by way of spending a decade at LucasArts as a uh, audio lead, sound designer, voice director type. Basically anything that comes out of the speakers, I was very, very interested in and, and you know, got involved in as much as possible because I've loved Star Wars my, you know, my entire, literally my entire life when I think about it, because I remember Star Wars before remembering seeing it for the first time. Oh, wow. Uh, because I was born in 75 and the move, first movie came out, you know, just before I turned two. And it's just always been there, you know. My first Star Wars memory, um, you know, besides uh, a friend of mine having, a, you know, this fancy thing called a VHS and the fact that I could watch it all the time and probably should have been outside playing, but just wanted to keep watching it again um, is my first memory. But my best memory is seeing Return of the Jedi with my grandfather um in the summer of 83 because um i had already seen it three times and they were visiting and everyone wanted to go see a movie because it was 100 degrees outside mm -hmm. and um uh uh what happened sorry i'm getting all these emails this morning um <laughs> what happened was um uh they all wanted to go see mr mom oh wow you know and i i was so upset because i i was like how can you possibly go to a movie theater knowing that a Star Wars movie is playing and not see it? I, I, I threw a bit of a tantrum, um, you know, and my parents were a little exasperated, but patient um, to their credit. And my grandfather said, why don't you take everyone to go see Mr. Mom and I'll take David. Uh, I mean, I was just beside myself upset at the thought of going to the, to the theater next to it, just not see it. So close. Um, so my grandfather took me alone to go see Return of the Jedi for the fourth time. And that was one of probably, probably the, purest most wonderful star wars experience i had as a child was uh was was that um you know and and you know collecting some of the toys and the first time i saw millennium falcon when a kid brought it to school and you know uh and then the video game started rolling in first on the atari 2600 and then you know uh when i thought it was all over and the novel started coming out in 1991 92 by 93 i i played super star wars on the uh super nintendo and i and then x-wing and and uh rebel assault and i just 
couldn't believe that, you know, this childhood love was coming roaring back in a new, uh, new medium. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, by the time Dark Forces and TIE Fighter came out, I was just a fanatic all over again. I mean, raging fanatic, reading all the books, driving all over town, trying to find the power of the force figures, um, you know, that had just come out that first wave on the orange cards where they're super, you know, buffed out and crazy looking, you know, yeah. um, comic books, anything I could do, you know, video games. And, uh, and that led to me, you know, steering a career towards an internship at Skywalker Sound in 99. And I've been kind of uh, with the company in one fashion or another ever since. Awesome. And we, we talked about your first time seeing Star Wars, but what made you fall in love with Star Wars so much that you are literally spending your whole life with it? It was, it was just, I mean, the simplest way to put it is that it was cooler than everything else. It had mm-hmm. everything, you know, it had, it had what to me was a more compelling and dramatic story. It had really cool characters. It had, the craziest visuals and visual effects, amazing music and sound, obviously. And at that time, I remember thinking, I, I was, I remember being conscious of the fact that it was huge, you know, that it was, that it was bigger than anything else. Yeah. And that kids at school talked about it more than anything else. And I thought about it more than anything else. And I remember consciously waiting for something else to be that big. And it, in, in my childhood, it just never happened. And, and, and um, along came a lot of Star Wars kind of, uh, you know, ri- I hate to say ripoffs, but, you know, a lot of movies that were trying to be Star Wars. And, and I was very conscious of the fact that they never could measure up, you know, and, and then for The Empire Strikes Back to be as complex as it was. And, you know, I was at the right age for Return of the Jedi. So I, I, I had zero cynicism about the classic trilogy at all. You know, yeah. it was uh, it was just a very pure experience those three movies and everything that came out of it um and so i think it was just the fact that everything just seemed better and that really led to an authentic interest in what was happening behind the scenes and 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 i think a lot of star wars fans share this a a real interest for the process of making things you know people want to see behind the curtain just like they do uh in your series you know people want to know about how things are made and and um you know, they find it interesting. And, and I don't know if, I honestly don't know if that's true for, for every um, fan fandom, but it certainly is for Star Wars. Um, and I experienced that firsthand as a child. Wow. And as a fan, how did you get involved in moving from fandom to Star Wars on the professional level? How did you get involved with all these productions? Yeah, so I, I, um, I started... You know, as a teenager, I was I was really involved in music, and I was one of those kids doing a lot of theater. I traveled a lot, um, you know, not just through the state of California, but went to Europe a couple of times, and all amateur theater, but you know, with um, children's theater group. And um, by the time I got in college, was absolutely sure that I was going to do something in entertainment. You know, that I was mm-hmm. going to either be an actor on Broadway, because that's all I really knew, or I was going to move to Los Angeles or, <clears throat> you know, play in a band or something like that. And my love for Star Wars just kept growing and growing and growing. But so did my love for technology. Um, you know, everything was going digital at the time and tape machines were starting to go away. And um, I decided to uh, go to Berkeley College of Music and study music production and engineering and, and post-production. Um, and part of it was like, all right, well, let me just, you know, let me see what happens if I apply to, you know, these acting schools and let me see if I apply to these technology schools. And, and I got into some places and not into others. And I ultimately decided that Berkeley was the way to go. And that led to an internship at the ranch. But I was so determined when I first got to Berkeley to, you know, steer my course load toward what would be helpful in an internship application. And then the fact that I got an internship there was an extreme amount of luck, but also just persistently emailing. (laughs) I emailed, um, someone came to visit and gave a lecture and gave me a business card from Skywalker Sound. And I must have emailed him once a month, very politely (laughs) saying, hey, if you ever need anyone to do anything, um, I would love to. And it, and it worked, you know, um, 
after, and that, but that was after a year and a half of doing that. And finally, and, the, and I had submitted an internship application, which at the time you had to mail in. Um, and it was considerable, multiple essays and letters of recommendations and transcripts. And I mean, it was, it was a, a very um, big application and, and they reviewed it. And I started in 99 on the scoring stage at Skywalker Sound, uh, just as a stagehand and an intern. Mm -hmm. And when things were a little slow in 2000, I applied as a sound assistant at LucasArts. And because I was from Skywalker Sound, even though I was a very low level, you know, um, they took a chance on me as an assistant level in games and I learned everything I could on the job, you know, starting just really as a librarian, um, logging sounds from episode one at the time, because that movie was new and I was writing descriptions for our sound database. I mean, it was very, very small. And then I started my first game I ever worked on was Escape from Monkey Island in 2000. It's the first yeah. credited game that I've I had. And my job was to master all of the dialogue that wasn't Guybrush Threepwood in English. This is just in English. Yeah. Um, uh, so that it all kind of mastered and played at the same level, all those different characters from all those different studio recordings. Um, and then from there, I moved on to Star Wars Demolition and Star Wars Starfighter that same year. Um, and that was a really eye-opening year for me and was the beginning of everything because the PlayStation 2 came out that December of 2000. Mm -hmm. And the company gifted every employee a PlayStation 2, which I couldn't believe. Um, and I just played it and played it and played it. And the console generation, that console generation changed games, that industry forever, yes. you know, because it was no longer a boutique PC shop that, you know, where games ship whenever they ship. Now there was a whole first party submission process and the, the sales and the dollars went way up, you know, it became a very big business. And it also started, you know, um, really looking at production value even more seriously than it had because computers and, you know, processors were getting more and more powerful all the time. Um, and so I think one of the reasons why I got hired is because I had been around Skywalker and they wanted um, more of a cinematic um, uh, aesthetic to their games because they were starting to, you know, really aim for, um, in certain cases, you know, movie quality as much as they could, we, you know, with our disk space and our memory, it was still yeah. very, very challenging and, is, and it still is today, but it was years off, obviously, but you know, that was, that was the effort that was happening at LucasArts at the time. And, uh, and uh, boy, I had a good time, but it was, you know, I went from being an assistant looking for work at the ranch to suddenly being, having more work than I could possibly handle in <laughs> games. Um, and that didn't really let up for about 10 years. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So that was, that was a really, a really uh, formative experience for me in my career. And, you know, I was still a fan and I remember being a fan um, serving me really well because, you know, people would ask questions about certain sounds and I'd be like, no, that's an X-Wing blaster. That's a, you know, that's, no, that's Amidala's blaster from episode one. That's too unique. You're not going to want to use that there. No, that's, you know, <laughs> the, you know, the TIE fighter. What's TIE fighter? Oh, it's twin ion engine. Oh, you know a lot about this stuff. Hey, come on over here. You know, like I, I my, my geekiness actually was, became an asset, you know, once, you develop the um once you kind of develop the uh um trust yeah then um then it's fine you know i think that's the hardest part is people need need to know that you're not going to let your fan you're going to keep your fandom in check and, ser and let it serve you professionally but nothing is more important than your your profession you know um, yeah that you're not going to spoil things that you're not going to um, lose your mind, which is easy to do when you're, you know, you've got sensitive material coming across your desk, you know, and I'm sure you, you, you've had that happen to you as well. Yep. Um, if you're under embargo or something. Um, and it was the same for, same for me. You know, I, I knew, um, how lucky I was and I didn't want to blow it. And, and when you talk about literally, they're just paying you to be a geek and you, you're talking about, you have, your mind blown because you're on the place you're working on the stuff you really love but you're still mm -hmm. that big star wars fan so how is it to work with george lucas when you're that big of a star wars fan well george george lucas was so busy on the prequels that um 
you know, my, my, um, sorry, I'm sorry that my uh, notifications are constantly making noise. Um, <laughs> My uh, my interactions with George Lucas, you know, I, I, I interacted with him a handful of times and usually socially, you know, um, uh, because he was not only was he running the companies, but he was full on directing episodes one, two and three and oftentimes wasn't even in the country. Um, you know, I was working with um, the project leads uh, like John Knowles, who had worked on Shadows of the Empire and and uh, was one of the original X-Wing developers. He was the, the director on Star Wars Bounty Hunter, for example. Yeah. So, you know, I was working with people like that. <clears throat> I was working with Darren Stinnett, um, who did uh, Outlaws and Dark Forces and, and, you know, was doing the Starfighter series or Tim Longo, who went on to direct Halo. And, um, you know, when we did Republic Commando, um, those, are, those are the people that I was working with day to day. You know, George would come and talk to us. He would review projects. I would oftentimes set up like i remember on force unleashed setting up you know um material for him to review but then i would need to you know get back to work um uh most of my experiences with with george happened later either at celebration or as a host when i would interview him um but you know at lucas arts at the time we were so busy and he was so busy um that uh you know he really let lucas arts um he gave LucasArts a lot of, uh, I shouldn't talk about George too much because I, you know, it's not like I talked to him about this, but um, it, from, from my sort of uh, low man in the trenches experience, it seemed like we had a lot of uh, creative freedom to explore and, and right. uh, try new things. And, you know, when I was at LucasArts, I worked on an RTS, I worked on a first person shooter, I worked on, you know, um, uh, uh, Starfighter games. I worked on uh, RPGs. I worked on um, MMOs. You know, I worked, you yeah. know, like Galaxy. I mean, I, I, we got to work on everything, and that's so rare. I, and I think that's just because of the power of Star Wars. That not only were we working with internal teams, but we were also working with all of these incredible other developers. You know, that were making different games. You know, yeah. like uh, we got to use the Ensemble engine for Battlegrounds, although that was an internal team. You know. Um, that was really fun to, to experience. You know, I learned a lot um, just by being in the building and uh, credit to George Lucas and the entire executive staff there that just let LucasArts um, really experiment and try a lot of different things. Oh, Factor 5. I, I, those are the games I wish that I could have worked on. I never got to work on the Rogue Squadron games because Factor oh, 5 did all of those. But oh, I got man. to be around when the dialogue was recorded and, I, you know, I just kind of, the excitement of every time they put out another game, even if it was, you know, Battle for Naboo or one of, you know, like Rogue Leader, uh, Rebel Strike. I remember all those games so well. Um, really, really a fun time to be at LucasArts. Yeah, Rogue Squadron 2 is the only game that made me buy a purple game console ever. <laughs> 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 that that game on GameCube was so good. Uh, that oh, really, yeah. It, it, oh, it, was, it was, at the time, looked looked you know photo the most photo real thing we'd ever seen on a console you know yep. because those ships looked so good you know it was like the gran turismo of star wars exactly um, oh, man. i played a hell of a game <laughs> yeah beautiful game yeah um I, if, if we talk about star wars games what are the elements uh, a star wars game needs to be a great star wars game oh man um well <clears throat> with the caveat that i'm not a game director Mm -hmm. um, but I am a fan. I mean, I certainly can talk about it from a sound perspective. Um, I think that any Star Wars game is fantasy fulfillment. And, um, you know, the core of Star Wars uh, is, is uh, I think, a, you know, it, it needs to feel epic. And there needs to be, um, I think, a, a, you know, a, a lot, a lot at stake, which I think is why the Knights of the Old Republic felt so good. You know, it yeah. was set in its own time period and it freed them to tell a very epic story. Um, yeah. I, I think that that's really, really important. You know, I think it's fun when you do things that are kind of like, you know, just before the the battle of, of uh, you know, the battle over Naboo happened, you know, this happened. I think that stuff is fun. But what I really love are the huge uh, epic stories, you know, um, yeah. or the untold stories like, you um, I loved the story. I loved working on the story for Force Unleashed. Um, I loved working on Republic Commando. Um, you know, I loved that. Um, even though the Commandos were not, you know, the Skywalker saga, 
um, everything that they were going for was earth earth shaking for them. You yeah. know, it was big, um, including uh, the beginning of the Clone War, or excuse me, the uh, Kashyyyk invasion at the end. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think story is really important. And so supporting it with epic sound and, and music, I mean, it's, it's kind of embarrassing that we got to start with Ben Burt and John Williams as our, our template because, you know, the deck is stacked. You know, yeah. if, if, if that's what you're, you're starting with, you're making sounds to complement those core sounds. And, um, you know, I always gave this example of Felucia, for example. You know, Felucia in episode three is on, you're there for, maybe four or five seconds so there's there wasn't a lot of sound source for felucia well we had to create a fully interactive world um the sound of a fully interactive world you know with um new physics engines and everything that was in the spirit of what we saw for just mere seconds in revenge of the sith yeah um that's a huge creative challenge and and one that we just like i mean i just i loved working on that stuff you know because you thought well you, you, you're you start getting into headcanon you know well if that's kind of what we heard in the movie then i'll bet you know this is what the you know what it would sound like for an extended period of time and i bet if you went over here it would be a little more desolate and if you went over here it would be a little more murky you know that kind of stuff was was really fun to talk about yeah those were our lunch conversations you know um <laughs> uh you know and then checking in on what the artists were doing and uh, Matt Amernick, um, the lead artist on Force Unleashed, and I, I mean, you know, we, we're friends to this day um, because we we loved working together on uh, on Force Unleashed. But yeah. um, I, I lost your question. What makes a great Star Wars game? Exactly. Uh, yeah, um, it's gotta it's gotta have a great story, and I think I think you know, gameplay is always going to be um, I think most important over everything, and. The mechanics in Star Wars provide great gameplay. You know, there's there you can be a Jedi, you can do a shooter, you can do a, a racing game, you can do a starfighter game, you can do uh, a, you know an epic RTS. Um, there's so many aspects of Star Wars to mine, not just for story but for gameplay as well. And I think as long as you're thoughtful about it and and give fans you know. Uh, what they want and go, you know, a little farther to surprise them, then you're going to make a great game. Nice. Um, I remember the first time I saw Empire at War, which I did not do. I did some voices for Empire at War, but that was all uh, a sound designer named Frank Klopacki. Um And uh, I just remember thinking, this is an epic space battle that I want to play immediately, you know? Yeah. Um, they did such a great job on those games. Yeah. Um, when we met, I, I just looked it up. It was in 2010 uh, at Gamescom in Cologne. Oh, it was 2010. 2010, okay. yeah. Uh, we were talking Happy about... 10 years. Yeah, exactly. This is our anniversary. <laughs> uh, we were talking about yeah. the Force Unleashed and the fact that you were playing Proxy in the game, the robot. How yes. Did, how did you get that part? Great question. Proxy. Are you okay? Yes. I think so, but I think it may be best if you leave me here. What are you talking about? The shockwave. It burned out portions of my processor. My primary programming has been erased. So, you know, I, I think I mentioned before that I was, you know, going to be an actor. Mm -hmm. um, and when you graduate college and you're trying to figure out which way you're going to go and and I went to Berkeley and then suddenly I got an internship at Skywalker Sound. I said, well, this is what I'm gonna do and I'll have to you know, put the acting thing away. Well, as you get older, who you are just kind of ekes out of you no matter what you do. And uh, when I was at LucasArts around 2000, 2001, the voice department would send out these emails saying, hey, we need to do some scratch or temporary dialogue for our games before we go and cast these actors, does anyone want to come and read up in the studio? And I said, sure, I'll read, you know, along with a bunch of other employees. And after I did it the first time, they would call me up all the time to read Scratch. So at one point, my game was, or my voice was all over Galactic Battlegrounds. At one point, I was playing Qui-Gon <laughs> in Star Wars Obi-Wan. At one point, you know, I was in uh, 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 Dark Forces, uh, what did we call that? Dark Forces 2, uh, Jedi, no, Jedi not Knights. Jedi. The, the, the one after that. Um, Jedi Academy? No, that was before my time. That was 97. Um, the one that Raven did. 
How oh, can yeah. I forget this? Not Jedi Academy, the one before that. Um, Jedi Knights. Jedi Outcast. Jedi Outcast, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I was doing Stormtroopers and that, that sort of thing. At least I think I was. And <clears throat> by the time KOTOR came around, um, they had these massive scripts that was just filled with alien gibberish. And a lot of actors were struggling with it. And certainly employees weren't able to scratch it. And I went in and I read a trend ocean. Yeah. And I did my best sort of boss compression from empire. And I just read the script, you know, the way it was written fanatically. And then I did a, I think I did a, um, I, I think I did a Twi'lek and something else. And the director who eventually became my boss was like, I don't have anyone that does this type of thing. Um, and so he gave me what's called a Taft Hartley into the actors union and they paid me a fee and they shipped it. So my first um, voice in a game was a trend ocean in, in uh, KOTOR one. Oh, wow. And that was only on the PC version at the time. Now it's in every version, but um, that was for the PC version because the Xbox version had already shipped. Yeah. And then from there, I, I was in Star Wars Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront 2, Revenge of the Sith, a bunch of mobile games. Like I started just appearing in games all the time. And when we got to Force Unleashed, I'd already, my voice had already been in a ton of games. And I got an agent in 2005 and I started booking other stuff, you know, other, other games and, and uh, some commercials and some, some uh, maybe some animation. I'm trying to remember, um, but definitely commercials and other games. You know, and, and I had done some stuff for Telltale and um, some of their CSI games. I remember I did and America's Army and some other things. And um, uh, when Force Unleashed came around, I was working on the story and I was the audio lead. And Sam Witwer was um, a friend of mine from for multiple years. I'd known him already for seven years or something like that. Um, right. Seriously, I was talking to her. Um <laughs> And so we had met because one of the schools I had applied to Juilliard, I didn't get into, but my best friend, and I had applied because my best friend had gotten in from high school the year before. And he was in the same class as Sam at Juilliard. And he said, you know, my buddy and Sam being a big Star Wars fan, uh, my friend Patrick said, my buddy's working at LucasArts and he introduced us. And we just started chatting on the phone like Star Wars fans as early as 2000, 2001. And we just kind of kept tabs with each other. We were always looking for projects to do. I think I, I knew he was an actor and he had been guest starring in a couple of things. And um, I, I let him read for, uh, I think, uh, Republic Commando, Battlefront 2. I had him just keep submitting auditions. Well, around that time, he did Battlestar Galactica and Dexter as a guest star. Yeah. Although he was a cast member of Battlestar uh, playing Crashdown. And yeah. Um, Amy Beth Christensen, who, who is still there and making incredible art now for on uh, the animation and film side, she um, she drew a piece of concept art for what would be Darth Vader's secret apprentice. And he had this kind of like, you know, uh, dark short hair and, you know, very um, chiseled complexion. And and I looked at it with my boss and I was like, God, that looks like Sam, my, my buddy Sam. And he said, well, why don't you get his resume and his reel and slip it in the pile? Mm -hmm. And so I did. And um, also happened to mention to uh, Peter Hirschman, who was the vice president at the time, who just was the director of Medal of Honor uh, Above and Beyond that I just worked with. He was a huge fan of both Dexter and uh, Battlestar. And so Sam, Sam got an audition and I read across from him. I read across from everybody in the auditions. Um, for, you know, General Coda and Juno Eclipse. And we, he wasn't even Starkiller at the time. He was just Darth Vader's secret apprentice. We didn't know his name. And uh, uh, Maris Brood, everybody, Princess Leia. And um, by the time we were ready to shoot motion capture in February of 2006, which was still cutting edge, kind of a big deal at the time, there were certain characters that weren't cast yet. Um, you know, we didn't have our Bail Organa yet. We didn't have um, uh, Princess Leia. We didn't have Proxy. We didn't have a lot of characters. And so at the table read, I just read everything that wasn't cast. You know, we okay. had one person reading this, you know, the script like, you know, then Starkiller does this. But I read Vader. I read, I read everything. Um, and uh, I read Proxy. And when I was reading Proxy and Sam and I started improvising, 
everyone at the table read laughed, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and they were like, yeah, that's, that's, pro- that's the guy, you know? And Hayden Blackman had really specific ideas for proxy, you know? Um, and um, he worked with me a lot and they made, you know, they had me audition like two or three times, but I had already read the scratch dialogue and I think it was already in the game, but they were like, well, we're not sure we're going to keep it. And then I think I did one, one other session and, you know, we had a couple of artists that were like, you've got to let David do it. He's right for it. Um, and he's perfect. And he's an actor and all that stuff. Um, but since I'd worked there, he wasn't sure. And uh, eventually they said, you know, you got the part and that must've been 2007, something like that. Yeah. And uh, that's how I got that role. But it was, you know, like anything in this, in, in this business, it takes years of, of uh, gradual um, steps, you know, it's never, you know, the whole like overnight success is, is a myth, you know, it's all so gradual. And that's what happened. It took years of me kind of doing voices here and there for a break like that to happen. Yeah. Um, sorry, that's a long story, but that, <laughs> that's how it happened. <laughs> um, as, you, as I sip my coffee. <laughs> Um, well, the thing is, you, you don't only voice games. Uh, your voice can be heard in Boss Baby now on Netflix. And yeah, yeah. you're even in the Star Wars movies. And you're even in The Mandalorian. How did that yeah. happen? How did you become a voice uh, I, in I mean, Disney I, Plus' biggest hit ever? <laughs> I can't talk about that too much. Um, right. uh, unfortunately, without with, with, you know, I have to kind of keep it to games because it's not really my place. Sure. To talk about Mandalorian. Um, you know, what I can tell you is that, like you said, it is gradual. Um, I owe a huge, here's what I can tell you. And, you know, and, and like I said before, it all builds from, from a small, uh, you know, from small beginnings, but I was a voice actor. I left LucasArts in 2011 and moved to Los Angeles. Um, I had an, I got an agent in LA, started working at Sony PlayStation and just started auditioning for things here and there. It wasn't until I read Han Solo in Kyle Newman's radio dramas yeah. at Star Wars Celebration. And, um, I, and I also did it for, uh, what was at the time, the Force, the Force cast, which is now Rebel Force Radio. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I, they had me read a little Han Solo. When all of that came together at Celebration and I read in front of people, um, Tom Kane's agent was in the audience. And she gave me an opportunity to sign with Tom's agency, CESD, who I'm still with today. And once I did that in 2015, everything changed. You know, I I suddenly started booking, you know, uh, more video games some commercials. Um, You know, uh, the DreamWorks thing happened because I booked Voltron. Um, I play this character, Commander Morvok in Voltron, Legendary Defender for DreamWorks. Yeah. And then I got an audition for Boss Baby and I did that and I was expecting my, my firstborn at the time. And I happened to mention that in the callback and I got cast in Boss Baby and started doing a lot of anime dubbing, um, you know, and then other series like One Punch Man and, and uh, um, Sword Art and, you know, some other anime series. Um, that really started everything. And I think my relationship with um, Skywalker and Matt Wood because of the Disney sale, you know, I'd started mixing a lot of behind the scenes stuff for um, uh, like the Rogue One Blu-ray and the Last Jedi Blu-ray and right. eventually, you know, made it back to Skywalker Sound and was lucky enough to be invited to start doing some voices, uh, you know, background voices in the movies in around 2015. And that's about all I can say about that. Sure. Um, but yeah, I've been very lucky. I Yes, I've been very lucky to have my voice in, in the uh, last five Star Wars films as well as two seasons of The Mandalorian. Yeah. Yeah, really awesome. Um, you just mentioned Rebel Force Radio. I think loads of fans know your name because of Star Wars Oxygen, um, the, the deep dive on the Star Wars music yeah. you did there. And yeah. after that, you even started the Soundtrack Show, a new podcast yeah. in which you talk everything soundtrack. Uh, yeah. where, where did this love for soundtracks come from? I mean, I've, I've, loved, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've loved John Williams' music my, my whole life. I mean, it really came from John Williams, and I think that's probably pretty obvious to anyone that yeah. listens to the show. <laughs> Being a musician, I, I, you know, when I studied music in college, it was like, it was such a revelation because they were giving names to things that I already kind of knew. Because, you know, I mean, the first time I heard Petrushka by Stravinsky, I was like, this sounds like John Williams. <laughs> you know, the first time I heard Prokofiev, I was like, this sounds like John Williams. The first time I heard... Um, 
uh, uh, Carmina Burana by Carl Orff. This sounds like John Williams. You know, it yeah. was a gateway. Star Wars was a gateway into my love for orchestral music. You know, and, and I look, I was a huge Metallica fan and I, you know, I played drums and guitar and all that stuff, you know, and I loved hard rock and Led Zeppelin. And I, I was really into all of that stuff as, as a teenager. But my brain just kind of saw it all as the same. You know, it was all, um, you know, uh, great music and string instruments and complex harmonies. And I studied jazz in college as well. And um, being on the scoring stage, I got to see a couple of really cool things. You know, I got to see Marco Beltrami score something. I got to, you know, set up um, uh, for John Debney doing an orchestral score. And that really started me down a path in, in the 2000s of just really being into soundtracks and working at LucasArts, I would hear those episode one, episode two um, and classic trilogy scores over and over and over again. Yeah. And I just started thinking about them a lot. And I have to give credit to Jimmy Mac McInerney from Rebel Force Radio because it was really his idea. And I, I, you know, I, I know I've said this before, but I can't emphasize it enough. It was his idea for me to start talking about music after just a phone call we had one day and I was telling him about the scoring stage and my experiences there. And he's like, you know, this would make a really good podcast. And I went off and I thought about it and I was happy. I was reading Jonathan Rinsler's book on empire or Jedi. I can't remember. Cause they just been released digitally. Um, and I was like, man, this really would make a great podcast. Yeah. And so we tried it. I think our first episode was November of 2013 and, and, um, and there was a real hunger for it. People really, uh, really responded to it in a way that I found totally surprising. So my whole podcasting journey, I owe entirely to Jimmy. Um, and uh, um, I'm very, very grateful for them for sharing their audience and their platform. So that was, that was a really great experience. And I'm still so pleased. You know, when it came time to do the soundtrack show, I remember saying to, you know, Jimmy, after about a year of doing Oxygen, I said, you know, maybe we should do raiders maybe we should do star trek i mean i know you guys have a bond cast maybe we should talk about bond scores and he said you know i really want to stick with star wars and i totally understand that i mean they're more successful now than ever yeah um you know and eventually um especially as i started getting more and more involved in lucasfilm it, it put me in this awkward position of you know um having such a prominent fan podcast in you know for in star wars that you know as you know and then eventually i was hired again um that I, I kind of stepped away and it became, I think, a little easier for me to do a podcast about. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't even know how to, I have a new watch <laughs> that keeps beeping at me. <laughs> and I haven't figured out how to turn it all off and just have haptic. So um, I was not expecting this to be ruining my uh, interview. I'm sorry. But anyway, um, you know, the soundtrack show, especially when I talk about other things beyond Star Wars, is a little, a little easier for me to manage as an employee of Lucasfilm working on, you know, more top secret projects now. So yeah. Um, special thanks to those guys who are going very strong. And, and um, I really, really appreciate people listening to me talk about music, you know, and it, it's just because I think about it all the time, even when I'm watching, you know, uh, I think about sound and music constantly because it's what I do and it's what I'm, it's how I'm made, I guess. And, uh, and so I just started talking about how I heard things and um, with a hope that it would just make everyone um, it would enrich everyone's experience rather than detract from it. You know, the whole point is to make people love things more, not less. Um, and, um, and that has always been my sort of mission for any podcasting is to, is to enhance people's experiences and hopefully they take away something even more, you know, uh, special or, or are more in love with the thing that they already enjoy. Yeah. Um, and I think music does that to us anyway. Um, so if you just kind of point it out and say, Hey, here's, Here's kind of what's happening. Look how they put this together because I have those revelations working on it all the time. Like, Oh my God, that's brilliant. You know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, to just point it out is uh, I think um, uh, something that people seem to really like, and I'm really happy they do. I was recently watching the nightmare before Christmas and during yeah. the, the, the making Christmas song, I just heard your voice in the back of my head going D S E Ray. -E -E <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm I sorry. never knew what that was until I started listening to your podcast. So yeah, it's the first yeah. podcast that actually learned me something. <laughs> so oh, thank you nice. for that. <laughs> that's nice. Yeah, I did I did Nightmare Before Christmas uh, I know. last year or the year. Oh yeah, okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. Danny Elfman, man. Just what a powerhouse. Yeah, exactly. Um, What's your favorite Star Wars score and why? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, you know, I was looking at Rogue One again recently, and um, I don't bring it up because Ro Rogue One's not my favorite score, but I love how unique it is because it was the first time we really heard um, a score that wasn't, you know, a, a new take on cinematic Star Wars, but um, that wasn't what I was going to share about Rogue One. Um, what I was going to share is that I, it occurred to me that I hadn't seen the movie in four years and I right. couldn't believe it. And it's because we've been looking at so much new stuff that we've been almost overwhelmed by the amount of crazy, you know, incredible music coming out. So in answering your question, I feel like um, Force, Force Awakens, Last Jedi, Solo, all the new movies that have come out in the last five years and Ludwig Gordonson's score and, you know, the work that um, Michael Kramer has been doing. Uh, you know, like I just worked with him on uh, Lego Star Wars Holiday Special, the work that uh, uh, Michael Tavera did on Resistance, you know, that stuff is all incredible. Kiner's season seven of, of uh, Clone Wars. Uh, I'm not giving that a fair shake, and nor am I giving Last Jedi or Rise of Skywalker a fair shake, because I just haven't had the same amount of time with those yeah. as I've had with the first six films. So, of course, I'm going to tell you that one of the first six films is my favorite. That being said, and this might be shocking to a lot of people, um, it's probably a tie between Empire Jedi and The Phantom Menace. See, but then you get Revenge of the Sith. My God, <laughs> so good. But recently, it's I have to say it's probably The Phantom Menace because for me, The Phantom Menace... Nothing will ever be as classic as the first three films. So yeah. nothing will ever be as iconic or as great or as respected or as appreciated. But recently, The Phantom Menace has been the one that I gravitate to because it was the last time a score was made in that sort of old fashioned way where the movie kind of had to be more or less locked. And John Williams wrote so much music for that movie. Yeah. And the music was like his new period of writing sort of uh, choral elements and I mean, when he added a whole new layer to the Star Wars um, sound, which I think he had flirted with in Empire and Jedi, you know, that sound, the human voice. Yeah. When he had a full chorale singing um, in Sanskrit, you know, to basically uh, um, score the sort of ancient epic nature of, of light versus dark, Jedi versus Sith, and this sort of generations old uh, battle of light and darkness that that is a, a stroke of genius that i just i don't think we've ever seen anything quite like that with in terms of in terms of just something that fits so beautifully but um i guess you can call it a giant flex by john williams you know just yeah. saying i'm going to do something totally new i think a choir is just the thing and it's going to feel perfect and um and building his whole score around that moment working in reverse from the first time you see Darth Maul and, you know, um, some of the new themes, that movie is just such a feast in terms of its soundtrack. Um, before The Phantom Menace, I would have told you Empire Strikes Back. Um, mm. God, Return of the Jedi. And I love the classic Star Wars too. I'm terrible at this. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, this I is love not a fair question. It's really hard. <laughs> It's not a fair question, but you know, it's I, I have to say the Phantom Menace, if I'm forced to pick one, which already makes me uncomfortable, probably the Phantom Menace. Nice. Or Empire. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I always tell people that, that Duel of the Fates is the best musical track ever, in my opinion. Oh, do you? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the best. Is that your favorite one? Then? Yeah. Yeah. It's not my favorite movie soundtrack, but it's the best track ever. So <laughs> what's your what's your favorite what's your favorite movie soundtrack? I think Return of the Jedi, because I really like the epicness of the music at the back end of the movie during the space fight and everything. Oh, it froze um, up a little. Oh, there you are. I lost you for a second. The back half? Yeah, the back half. So during the space yeah. fight and the battle of Endor, that kind of stuff. I really love the musical compositions over there. Um, but yeah, Duel of the Face is just, in my opinion, the best John Williams ever did. So, yeah. Yeah, the end of Return of the Jedi, I mean, he he writes epic music for 30 minutes solid. Exactly. 30, 30 minutes of, you know, Battle of Endor 1, 2, and 3. And, you know, I mean, covering so much ground, going back and forth between the land battle and the space battle, and then the sort of epic lightsaber battle. I mean, 
It's yeah. an opera. It's opera. It is. I mean, it got me into opera. Um, I mean, I'm not like an opera fanatic, but I understand that they're all kind of variations of the same style. You know, movies, movies use operatic techniques in order to tell their story. They're not singing, but like the, that's what John Williams is doing. He's, he's making, you know, a uh, grand opera essentially, yeah. you know, exactly. Um, so I, yeah, I, I love, I love Return of the Jedi too. Yeah. Now I have to change my answer. All right. <laughs> so final question, just to bring it back to the video games. If they yeah. ever give you a big budget and you can create any type of Star Wars game, what kind of game would it be and what would be your role in it? Oh, wow. Um, I have this fantasy about, um, about doing HD versions of, of classic games. Yeah. You know, Star Wars Squadrons, EA just did a fantastic job with Star Wars Squadrons. Um, but I would love, you know, even to see Larry Holland's uh, X-Wing in, in HD. I would love to see, um, you know, I, I think the story that, that was written for Star Wars Bounty Hunter is so good. Mm -hmm. I would love to, to work on an HD Bounty Hunter. I'd love to do an HD version of Force Unleashed. Like, I've thought about that, you know, um, before, because I love, and maybe it's, you know, the way I work on uh, soundtrack show is I love studying old productions. I love reading about old movies. I love reading about, um, you know, what composers went through and sharing that in my podcast. And, um, and I think the idea of unearthing old assets for, for, for earlier games and bringing them to, to new consoles would be so fun to work on, but that's not really what you asked, but that is the first <laughs> thing that's, I think about that a lot. Um, yeah. but if I, if I had to, it would probably be, I think the closest I ever got to it was Force Unleashed because it was a, an epic game about a force wielder with, uh, you know, with a sort of crisis of conscience um, and incredible force powers and an epic story. Um, and I got to be involved in, you know, a part of a story group for that before there was a thing called story group. Yeah. And, uh, and I love doing the audio for it. I love directing actors. Um, uh, I, you know, so if I was to be involved in something, you know, I, I don't think that I'm a great game designer. I love playing games, but you know, I've, I've been around great game designers and there, there's a, a level of genius there that, you know, Sometimes knowing how, you know, what your strengths and weaknesses are, are, you know, sometimes knowing what your weaknesses are, are just as, or sometimes more important than your strengths. Yeah. You know, and, um, you know, uh, if you put the right person in the right, if you collaborate with the right people, you can make something great. I don't think anyone wants to play a game designed by David Collins. Hmm. Um, but I do think that people would, um, I do think that, you know, working in sound, you look at a story and you sorry about this my goodness um, <laughs> we're almost I'm done <laughs> um you look at uh you look at us at a at a at a story and your job is to service that story and give it the most tremendous impact that you possibly can what's going to really make this pop off the screen whether it's a game or a tv show or anything that's been my entire career is is being in service of a narrative and, and looking at something, even in its rough form and helping to shape it. Yeah. And so for me, I, I, you know, I'm very comfortable in doing what I do because I would want to collaborate with, um, with a great writer, a great game designer, a great engineer and put together um, some sort of epic console experience, um, you know, uh, as, as a key creative, not just in audio, but also working with actors and, uh, you know, working on the script and also working on the pacing of things. I, I do think that, um, you know, gameplay versus um, story is really hard to get right. Um, I've worked on games that had too much story and not enough gameplay and, and vice versa. Yeah. And um, I would really want to have input into that. Um, I'm very lucky because my time at Sony, I got to work with some of the greatest storytellers I've ever met. Um, you know, I got to work on uh, the Uncharted games and Last of Us with Naughty Dog. I got to work on God of War with Santa Monica Studios. I got to work on smaller titles, um, you know, like Journey and things and the Unfinished Swan and really see some of these developers and how their minds work. And, um, you know, I just witnessed some really 
awe-inspiring uh, storytelling. And I, as you can tell, I'm a story person. Yeah. Um, but uh, never in sacrifice of gameplay. Um, you know, but uh, I don't know if I answered your question or made it more confusing. I would want to be part of a small game team making a great epic story, even if it's not, um, uh, you know, triple A, like even if it's, if it's, uh, you know, like a text-based adventure or something like that, I would yeah. still want to really, really work on that story. Interesting. Um, yeah. Nice. I miss adventure games sometimes. Those were true. Fun. Yep. True. Well, that concludes the interview, I guess. Um, if people are interested in David Collins, where can they find you? Probably the easiest place would be on Twitter or Instagram at David W. Collins. Um, I have a show called uh, The Soundtrack Show, which you can do a Google search for, or you can just look, follow me at, at Soundtrack HSW or go to soundtrackpodcast.com. Um, and if you're not a music person, don't worry about it. It's actually made for everybody. You know, it's made for people that love the movie primarily or love the TV show primarily. And then we talk about, you know, what the music's doing to help us relate to the characters, for example. Um, if you do have kids, throw on Boss Baby back in, back in Business on Netflix. I, I play the dad uh, as well as very small other parts on that. Um, it's true. My voice is all over Jedi Fallen Order and The Mandalorian and, and <laughs> Star Wars films, usually as a stormtrooper. Um, I was joking this morning that I think I've died 1,138 times uh, this season. <laughs> um uh but uh but yeah um probably twitter at david w collins is usually right. where i post those things awesome thank you so much david yeah thank you and i hope to see more and hear more of you in the coming future <laughs> okay thanks so much and yeah thank you for being on this uh, this interview yeah 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 thank you all right